Welcome back to the Crypto Trends Podcast, where we cover all things cryptocurrency, blockchain, Web 3.0, and AI. I'm Robert Croak, and I'm joined by my co-host, Armando Pantoja. Both of us and our amazing team are excited to bring you the best information, guidance, and strategies each and every Wednesday. So follow along and always remember to take notes and take action. In this week's episode, we're going to talk about why Bitcoin pulls back to local lows, why are altcoins getting crushed during Bitcoin's pullback, and new altcoin callouts, as well as the strategy. And at the end, that section will be dedicated to answering all your amazing questions. So let's get into talking point number one, which is Bitcoin takes a dip. Armando, what do you make of Bitcoin's price action over the last week? I have a good feeling I know what you're going to say. I'm excited, but uh, take it down for our listeners, and uh, let's really get into this. Now, when I see Bitcoin fall, I always look at it as an opportunity, and this was expected. If you've been listening to the Crypto Trends podcast, we've been talking about uh, Bitcoin possibly falling around the halving. Bitcoin reached all-time highs before the halving. This has never been happened before. So there was a not a lot for us to go on or what to expect. But I think what possibly happened is that the institutions, the banks, and the, uh, the rich pushed Bitcoin past the all-time highs, and there just wasn't enough momentum left to get it any higher than that uh, without the retail involvement. Yeah, I agree, Armando, and I think that's shown in the technicals. I think there's two major takeaways from this. Uh, number one is Bitcoin nearly doubled from the ETF approval catalyst. So, you know, the buy the rumor, sell the news kind of thing. And then number two, Bitcoin now needs consolidation until its next major catalyst, which is the halving happening, you know, in a few days from this episode. Yeah, exactly, Robert. I just want to say to our listeners that imagine Bitcoin exploded after the ETFs were approved. Now, imagine what's going to happen once the having it, once the retail investment comes in, once other countries around the world approve Bitcoin ETFs and maybe even Ethereum ETFs. The, this is going to cause the demand to skyrocket. Remember, the having limits supply. If the demand comes in and is stronger than what it is today, we can expect just based on the basic laws of supply and demand, and the basic laws of economics that crypto and Bitcoin in specific has to respond positively to that situation. Yeah, something for everyone to consider talking about the ETFs is that we saw that pullback where Bitcoin went down to like 38K. And then prior to the halving, we were back up over all time highs. And that's why I still believe we are early in this bull market. When this halving hits, the supply dynamic improves because Bitcoin production gets cut in half and demand either remains the same or increases. So as a result of this, price typically increases as well. And this is very important for everyone listening and following along to understand. I remember in last week's episode, you and I were discussing the strong possibility of Bitcoin bouncing between all-time highs and 60K for a little while, and we saw that happen. While none of us knew what was going to happen with Iran and Israel and some of the news that happened, so many people just had these knee-jerk reactions, which we strongly suggest you don't do. So while this isn't what a lot of you wanted to hear, this is a scenario that has started to play out. And this is typically what happens leading into and a few following after the halving. And, and it really is out of everyone's control to know exactly what's going to happen. That's why we try to give you these updates in our lives, in our private communities, because at the end of the day, news happens, wars happens. COVID happens. There's always something that can come up and cause fear in the markets and cause drawdowns. And this is what happened in the last couple of weeks. So with respect to the halving, miners begin taking profits on Bitcoins when they've been accumulating while the mining reward was higher and retail investors immediately buy up on those sales. This creates a steady balance of buying and selling, which is so important for everyone to pay attention to. And when the mining selling pressure subsides, usually a few months after the halving, that's when we generally see prices skyrocket. And that's why we say, when the halving comes in the next few days, don't expect a big candlestick up in this crazy price action. It could remain stagnant or even down for a little while after the halving. And everyone just needs to just relax, when in doubt, zoom out, and be able to follow along so they know what to do in this price action. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, another point I want to make is a lot of people don't realize how much Bitcoin and the overall crypto market has matured over the last few years. A lot of people don't remember, but back in 2017, late 2017, I think it was December, uh, that was the first time that the masses were able to short Bitcoin. And that caused the price to, to plummet right after that. That was really the catalyst, one of the catalysts that caused that uh, drawdown in that cycle. So uh, when markets are immature, there's a, only a few participants. That means that the price movements are normally very violent, very uh, volatile. As the market starts to mature, more participants come in and the price starts to become less volatile, more stable. There's people paying both the short side and the long side. People plan for profits as it falls and people plan for profits as it rises. This causes the price to be more stable. So that's the reason why we're not going to see those 30, 40, 50 percent increases in one day. People don't remember back early in crypto. 2014, 13, 15, uh, we used to think 30% was is a normal day. You know, is that well, I had a friend that one time he would call, like I would call him and say, hey man, uh, Bitcoin's up 10% today. He, he would hang the phone and say, don't call me unless it's 30% or more. And that's that was normal. Yeah, <laughs> people didn't get excited like they do now. But now, you know, as Bitcoin is becoming more mature, uh, we're seeing that price stabilize a lot more. And, uh, you know, we, we get excited now over five, six, maybe even 7%. Uh, but like I said, it's, yeah, Bitcoin can increase that strength again once the retail investment and involvement comes in. But for the short term, I expect the price to trade sideways as the halving starts to take effect. Yeah, exactly. And that's how consolidation works. Now that we're in a more mature market, there's a lot more buying and selling taking place on a daily basis. We have the retail investors, we have other countries, we have all of the big ETFs now. So we're not seeing this, the normal buying like we did in the early cycles. And so right now the buying pressure is going back and forth, which is why we've seen prices go up and down within a range. Um, so it's still my belief that the bulls, sooner or later, uh, will regain control and the market will begin to pump again. So what are your thoughts on that? Because that's the $100 million question that everyone asks us, is where is it going and in what time frame? So touch on that a little bit for our listeners. Yeah, I think it's hard to pinpoint when that selling is going to subside, but we're less than a week right now away from the halving. Uh, so I think that's going to be a major catalyst for this bull market going forward. And remember, it's not going to happen immediately. It's not going to be the next day we're going to see Bitcoin go up. There's still some miners that are going to sell some Bitcoin into the market as they give up. There's going to be a lot of things happening. I, I believe that the institutions and the banks are going to use it as a sell the news event. Uh, and try to push the price down one last time. Uh, so it's not an immediate effect. It never has been. But also the media is going to use that as an uh, opportunity to push the price down. Because then they can say two things, like they've always said in every having, is that the having it didn't take effect this time. Or they're going to say that the having's already been priced in. That's going to scare some retails and some of the unsavvy investors away. And that's what they want. That will get the price down enough so that the retail, so that the banks, the elite, and the rich will have one last time to get into the market. Yeah, and so the news broke a few days ago that China, uh, in Hong, through Hong Kong, uh, approved Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. Now, that's going to allow the uh, Asia market to uh, make sure that the Bitcoin price is more stable, and it's going to bring in a lot of investors. Asia is one of the biggest markets on the planet. Here on this podcast, we've talked a lot about China's obvious and eventual re-entry back into the crypto market. No, I, had, I didn't hear anybody else talking about that, except here on the Crypto Trends podcast. Now, th this is why it's important to keep your finger on the pulse here on this podcast, because we're always first to the news. Another thing I want to say is that Price manipulation is highly likely to happen over the next few months. Like I said, with the news of the having, the media is going to take advantage. You can scare some retails away. Uh, and I think that this is going to be that chance for those big investors who have been on the sidelines for a while, the late adopter investors, to get their positions in before that mass retail involvement. Yeah, these are all great points, and I couldn't agree more. Um, when everyone was freaking out during the dip last week to 60000 I immediately took this to social media to explain that this was, again, likely market manipulation at its finest. You saw Peter Schiff talking about how Bitcoin has no store of value, which is crazy to me. Uh, and he talked about how he could see Bitcoin going down to $20,000 in this bull run. But of course, Peter Schiff is pushing the gold narrative. So, hmm, I wonder why he'd be against Bitcoin. So that's interesting. Then you also have to look at the Chinese announcement of their approval. So 
why would they be prone to want to manipulate the market? Because they want to get their billions of dollars in from all of their hedge funds and, and family offices at a much lower price. And this is why no matter how much we stress to all of you to stay in touch, don't have knee-jerk reactions, and follow along and make sure to understand the broader market because so many of you, even though you listen to us each and every week, you don't execute on what we say because you have knee-jerk reactions and then you sell, take your profits and sit on the sidelines because you feared that manipulation. So I'm not discounting the geopolitical events that happened over the weekend. They certainly have been a driving force you know, behind this sell-off. But to me, this move is just strictly market manipulation because of how quick it was and how it works just so everyone can have a lens of understanding. If you're sitting there and you see the bad news and you see Bitcoin or any of the cryptos break down and you immediately sell, what happens is millions of others just like you that are fearful and don't understand the manipulation also sell, and that's what causes these big corrections. Because if you zoom out and look, there is no reason for a big correction right now in cryptocurrency. It's just market manipulation and fear because so many of you don't understand the broader market, and that's so important. Yeah, so it's a big thing that a lot of people don't understand is that when the market is hot, a lot of people don't have a lot of money, but there's one solution that can take out what's called a leverage trade. That means that they can put a small amount of money, borrow a lot more against that small amount, and then they're able to trade a lot more bigger sums. For example, if I got 100 bucks, I can go to some of these exchanges, get 100 times leverage, and I'm trading 10,000, mm -hmm. right? So if Bitcoin doubles, I don't make $200, $100 on my original 100 I make 10000 off my 100 That's a very, very attractive offer to a lot of people. And a lot of people tend to do that in Bitcoin up cycles. So what happens is that the banks, the elite and the rich who are smart, they can see how many people are over leveraged. Now, the problem with doing that is that when you do that, you ha if, if it goes down, you have to pay it back and yep. you don't have the money. So the bank in order, or the exchange in order to protect itself, they will force you to sell yep. without your control or consent at a certain level down. So what happens is that if you sell off 1% of Bitcoin, all those people who are leveraged are forced to sell. The market doesn't see it as a leverage trade or whatever. It sees it as somebody just sold $10,000 mm -hmm. worth of Bitcoin. If somebody else did it, somebody else did it, somebody else did it. As the price drops, more people get liquidated and it looks like a bigger sell off than it is. And then the banks are able to get in at those cheap prices. And that's why exactly retail investors, which are most of you that are watching this podcast, should not be doing leverage trades. If you don't know what you're doing and you don't understand the markets and the drawdowns and all of the technicals, you should not be doing this. In my opinion, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I think you should just stick to the basics, build up your portfolio, learn more. You're already here watching this podcast, so you're interested in learning, and then you can get Get into leverage trading once you get a little more sophisticated. That's my opinion. I don't think the average person needs to make it that difficult because that's how so many beginning traders get wrecked is they think it's cool, they can do this leverage, and then all of a sudden they can't pay the bill if it goes down and they panic and then they're putting money on credit cards, which is just a terrible strategy. Yeah, and like I said, is leverage trades is for the, the very advanced investor uh, that also has the time to monitor the investments or put in the right controls so if it goes bad, they're able to at least uh, you know, keep some of their money. It's very, it's, it sounds easy, but it's a lot more complex mentally, yep. emotionally, and technically to do leverage trades than it comes across when people are talking about it on YouTube or something like that. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I would tell people who are new, you got less than five years, maybe even 10 years experience to stay away from leverage yep. trades. So my main question, Armando, manipulation aside, is do you believe the selling is done or not leading into having or do you see a sideways market? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, like right now, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint exactly, you know, what's happening. Is it selling over? Is it not over? Because we're so close to the having. But I think we have uh, two scenarios that could happen from here. One is that there could be a deep impulse down. Uh, like we talked about before, the rich, the elite, and the banks can use that as an opportunity to, get, to cause some liquidations, and they can get the price down. Also, with the fear of the having, if some, a lot of people expect it to be immediately, they can use that sell the news event and say, oh, yeah, we all got to sell because, you know, or they can use the media to say that the having no longer has an effect. They can cause the impulse down. Uh, and that's going to scare the average investor out of the market. Uh, I heard a lot of reports which are completely incorrect 
They say that Bitcoin has hit its peak this cycle. That doesn't even make sense technically. It doesn't make sense uh, even common sense wise. It just makes zero sense. The second scenario I think could happen is that Bitcoin can range between 60,000 and 74,000. This would allow Bitcoin's price to consolidate at that point and go up in the short term. Uh, back to the all-time high levels as the having starts to take effect. Either way, I don't see any big price movements over the next few weeks. It could happen, but I, I doubt it's going to happen. It's too many unknowns with the having and then the miners uh, giving up and dumping on the market with uh, Hong Kong and the news manipulation. And it's a lot of variables. I don't. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what's going to happen, but I know long term Bitcoin is still on the trajectory to reach 200, 250. Uh, what do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, if I had my way, we would have a an app where we could control everybody's logins that listens, and then we could slap their hand virtually <laughs> and not let them go in and sell every time there's market manipulation, because they always regret it, and then they call me three days later and say, man, that was such a mistake. I sold because I thought it was crashing, and then it went back up higher, and I'm like... Again, it all comes down to understanding your investment thesis. If you believe one Bitcoin is going to be worth 200000 400000 500000 or a million dollars, like many of the experts and smartest people in the world believe, then why are you thinking about, or even worse, selling every time there is a pullback or a bit of market manipulation? It just doesn't make sense. If you zoom out two years, five years, 10 years, and you look at Bitcoin, this is what you see. You don't see all of the little the little peaks and valleys. And that's just the most important thing for people to understand in these markets. So with respect to what you said, I like both of those approaches and pretty much agree with everything you said. The only place we differ a little bit is that I still believe that Bitcoin can break its new highs in the weeks after the halving. I'm not saying this is the most likely scenario, but I do believe there is a strong possibility of that. You know, we've also talked that Bitcoin could stay sideways until the summer because after many previous halvings, there was not a lot of price action right away. It took sometimes months to really get moving and for everyone to get their footing to see what happens. This time is very different, though, because of the Chinese, the Asian approvals, the Bitcoin ETFs in the U.S. So it's very different. So no one really knows. And that's why we're constantly looking for clarity to understand where the markets are going and what's going to happen. So I feel We'll have a lot more clarity by the next episode, and the having will have already occurred. So we'll both be excited to see what happens from there. We can share our thoughts with the audience, but who knows what's to happen. We're very excited of everything moving forward. And of course, we're still very bullish on crypto and Bitcoin for sure. I don't see a situation where Bitcoin isn't 100, 200K in the next 18 months to two years. I just don't see a situation. So before getting into our next topic, let's take a second to hear from our amazing sponsor, Proppy. Whether you're a real estate professional looking to modernize your practice or a buyer seller eager to navigate the market with the latest technology, Proppy offers an unparalleled platform that simplifies, secures, and revolutionizes real estate transactions. Get ahead of the curve and explore how Proppy can transform your real estate experience today. For more information, go to proppy.com. Okay, so let's get into our next talking point. Altcoins experience a massive dip. Armando, the panic on the altcoin markets was unlike anything I've seen in a bull market. Can you walk our audience through it and what your thoughts are, you know, relative to what's happening in the overall markets and the timing of the of the altcoin markets? Yeah, uh, I've been in this space for since 2011, 13 years. Uh, this sometime this year, I don't know exactly when. Uh, and with the altcoin altcoin boom in 2015. Uh, there were some altcoins before that, but there were, you know, with the ERC-20 tokens, there was an explosion of altcoins with ICOs and all those things that happened in 16, 17, is that I've never seen as much panic in the market over altcoins as I saw in the last three weeks. Uh, and this has caused altcoins to drop down significantly. And it's, for me, it's, it's a great buying opportunity, right? But I want to get back to this because me and you talk about crypto a lot. And I, I say it all the time is that and you say it too, is that all coins have an exaggerated correlation with Bitcoin. When big, and what this means simply is Bitcoin goes up a little, all coins go up a lot. 
Bitcoin goes down a little, altcoins dump off a lot, right? And it's because on most exchanges, the number one trading pair is Bitcoin and whatever altcoin you have. So that's that's one of the biggest reasons. There's other reasons too, but that's one of the biggest. Uh, but and people still panic, mm-hmm. right? They still go crazy whenever they see altcoins go down. Oh, it's over. It's like the it's like the uh, chicken little with the sky is falling, right? It's 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 crazy the amount of overwhelming emotion I see in the, in our community as well as our individual pages. Uh, but like, how many times have we told our audience this? Is that stop letting your emotions overwhelm you? You know what's coming. You know about the exaggerated correlation. I was actually pretty excited when I saw these altcoins drop. And what I did is I went and bought some XRP Fetch and some Ethereum. Yeah, I told everyone when we were coming back from Miami that we, when we pulled over the car and started buying some stuff <laughs> when we saw the markets were down. And it really just comes down to, I think, that the reason altcoins react so much greater than Bitcoin in these ups and downs is because so many of the altcoin investors are more like gamblers and they panic sell because they don't know what to do because they're newer to the markets. And I believe that some of the more long-term investors in cryptocurrency that hold Bitcoin, Ethereum, Chainlink, XRP, they don't panic because they've seen it all before. And so, so many of these unsophisticated investors they just come into these markets and don't know what to do. So they're always in and out and up and down because they truly believe they can time it and no one can time the markets. So I guess for me, it really just comes down to having a strong understanding of Bitcoin's relative position to its overall bull market. Right now, it's clear to me that Bitcoin is still in the earlier stages of its bull run. So seeing altcoins at such discounted levels really excites both of us because we see it as opportunity and others see it as fear. And this is just really, really important for everyone to understand. You know, you always hear me and Armando say to take notes and take action. And right now is the most important time in your life as far as being an investor and learning these markets to take that seriously. I promise you, it is so, so important. If you've been taking notes, the action would be fairly simple to understand. Dollar cost average into the coins that are heavily discounted that we couldn't buy a couple months ago. We had call outs that we loved, but they were overbought and we couldn't rightfully tell you to buy these coins at those levels. Now that a lot of these altcoins are oversold, it makes it so much safer as a buy now than it was a couple months ago, which may seem counterintuitive because you're saying, oh, well, maybe they were late to that coin or that project. No. Some of the coins. I've called out in the last six months or a year. I called out three years ago as well, but because they were overbought, you just you didn't have a good entry point. And I think that's what's so important for everyone to understand right here. Yeah, uh, based on that notion of altcoins being down, I have found some jewels. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Is that uh, there's a couple I want to call out right now, and I'll let you guys know what we've been discussing within our offices. Is the first one is Celestia, uh, and that's CIA. I remember when this launched a few months ago, uh, and it went like straight up, right? Yep. And then uh, it continued to go up over the next few months after its release. And I always knew that that coin, coin would be great, but there was too much attention, too many. It was over. It was getting to the point of overbought, right? So I wanted to. I watched it for a while. Uh, just sat on the sidelines, and I knew one day there'd be a retraction, and here we are, retraction. So I think now a pullback like we are experiencing right now is a great time to get involved with that one. Uh, And it's time to start adding that Celestia to my portfolio. And I know a lot of our audience members have been asking our thoughts on this one. uh, And we agree that it's a great ad, especially in this pullback period that we're in right now. And that's not the only call out we've had. In recent weeks, we announced our call outs NXRA, LCX, RIO. Uh, which are all tokenization plays. And we explained that if they continued up, we'd be happy. But if there were pullbacks, we'd be more happy to add to these positions. And that's where we get the dollar cost averaging. And fortunately for us, we've received these pullbacks, which again, LCX, 100 people a night say, LCX is down, should I sell? No, you shouldn't sell. You should be buying more. You should be doing the opposite if you believe in the project and you've done uh, your research. 
Um, and our last new call out, which we've been waiting to get into, is Jupiter, J U P, which we believe is an absolute beast of an altcoin. Uh, we envision Jupiter being a much more efficient version of Uniswap, for example. And so we really like this one and Celestia. And we've really had to be patient with these because they just kept going up and we needed to find a good pullback to be able to jump in on these two. Yeah, uh, and that's an important, and this is a good segue into uh, this being an important lesson for our audience, right? Uh, it's very difficult sometimes emotionally to wait for that pullback, uh, especially for new traders. Uh, when you see that coin that you're looking at fly up and continue to go up, you, you sometimes you'll be overwhelmed with emotion to jump in. That's what we try to teach. With the right tools, you can pull back those emotions. And the thing about it is, that I remember watching Jupiter fly up 100 percent from where it actually caught our attention. It was very difficult, even as a seasoned investor, to sit back and wait. Yeah, I'll say it again. It was difficult, even for me. And people say, well, you've been trading stocks, crypto. You've been an investor in real estate and all this stuff over 10 years. Why would you have emotional? But well, it never goes away. Right? Well, what, yeah, but what people have to understand, especially when you're talking about new altcoins or meme coins, Dollar cost averaging is always the right strategy, but in these instances where a coin launches and goes straight up 300%, you can't really time that, and you never should try to time it. But in these instances, sometimes you have to wait for a pullback because you don't want to be dollar cost averaging around the top uh, of something that went up you know, 300% in a week's time. And it's different when you're talking about Chainlink or Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of these tried and true blue chips. That's different because you're not going to see those types of, you know, huge run-ups all at once. So it's so true, Armando. No one ever said that patience was easy, but it's certainly a virtue. And that's why it's so important that each and every one of you really listens closely to these episodes because we're really trying to impart our wisdom and experience from these cycles into all of you. We've both been at this for over a decade. We're not somebody that just jumped onto this cycle and created a, a podcast you know, just to jump on the bandwagon. We've been doing this for a very long time. And so you know, this dip in altcoins isn't something you should be freaking out about. It's really all about, like I always say, when in doubt, zoom out and just really understand the greater markets. Yeah, and I just want to touch back on the emotional part is that, uh, uh, yeah, people always, people, especially new investors, they are overwhelmed by emotion. And some people even, even quit because they can't handle it. They always ask me, how do you handle the emotional component? Even seasoned investors like us, if you don't be, if you're not careful, the emotions will overwhelm you. And the way that you fix that problem is that you, you have tools and you have information and you have training. And that will help you control those emotions. That's why it's so important to watch the Crypto Trends podcast or listen to the Crypto Trends podcast and other things like this is because with those tools, with that information, it's a lot easier to manage those emotions. We want each of you to take a second and comment on the coins you've purchased in this most recent dip, and we'll take a look at those as well. Uh, yeah, so this uh, this week we've re received a ridiculous amount of, of comments and questions. So I'm going to do so. We're going to do something that we've never done before. Is that we're going to instead of doing our third talking point today, we're going to go into a lot of those questions and discuss those comments and questions that were left by our audience as a way to show appreciation for your effort and for your support. Uh, so Robert, can you take us into that first question? Absolutely. Asks, what are two to three projects that you believe will at least two to three x from here? Wow, I think we could do. 50, but let, let's take two that are top of mind. We've called this one out before, O-R-N-J, Orange. I really, really love this project. Everyone should do their research on it. And a new one that I'm really, really liking is Pendle, P-E-N-D-L-E. -E. Uh, you heard it here first. Uh, I really love this project. I think it's going to do really well coming up in the market, and it's a great buying point right now. Uh, so we got Andy has asked us, what's your strategy for managing risk investing in a low market cap coin? Uh, what he means is below $50 million market cap. Uh, so the strategy for that is that you got to remember those, are, those don't have a lot of volume normally. That's why their market caps are so low. Uh, so you have to be careful. You have to practice a higher level of risk management because they're more likely to be rug pulls. They're more likely to be liquidity issues. There's more likely to be a lot of issues because there's not a lot of people moving in and out of the coin. So you just have to practice risk management at a higher level uh, than you would at a coin like Ethereum or Bitcoin. So that's all you have to do. Uh, it's okay to do it. 
uh, but you just can't put all of your money in these coins because the, one of the biggest issues is that uh, the ability to pull your money out. Uh, and if it's a smaller cap coin, and let's say you put 10, 20, 30,000, it may take you hours to get that money in and out. You may even affect the market when you sell. So you have to just be careful uh, with those sub, uh, those low market coins. Lex asked, you talk about dollar cost averaging for getting into positions. Is there a dollar cost selling, if that makes sense, for exiting your positions? This is a great question. So here's my thoughts. Everyone's thesis for taking profits, selling, is different. And you have to understand what you want out of this investment when you make it. So for instance, if you want to see a 100% return, a 200% return, a 300, whatever the return is you desire, then you have to look at when do you take profits. So let's use simple math. Let's say you invest $1,000 and it goes to $3,000 and you want to take profits. What you could do then is take out your original $1,000 plus maybe a 50% return on that money and then leave the rest of the money to roll. We call it playing with the house's money where you leave that to continue to grow and grow. And what that does is allows you to book a win and book that 50% return right out of the gate and then everything else is gravy on top for you. I think this is a great strategy and it can be 20% return, 50%, 100%. Whatever it is that you desire for that investment is how you can do it, and that's what you would do. Yeah, so we got Sharky asked, what is your favorite feature of the property network, and what is your price prediction for property in the bull market? Well, property, I really like property because property, property is a true real estate company. It's one of the only ones, I believe, on the blockchain. Uh, they're a true title company. They have all the license to operate as a title company. Uh, they address a lot of the fraud and issues in uh, real estate, the inefficiency more, more than anything else. And it, it, real estate is full of fraud and inefficiency. Those are two things that property will solve. Uh, and like my prediction overall is that I think property can go from 10 to $20 from here. And the reason why I say that is that because property has reached almost $4 already, mm -hmm. right? Now, we're talking about pre-having uh, when Bitcoin was in a decline or Bitcoin was kind of stable. So when Bitcoin starts to move up to 100, 150, 200,000, uh, property will just be pulled up by Bitcoin's momentum. Uh, we always say a rising tide raises all ships. So a rising Bitcoin normally raises all altcoins. So I think property will benefit from that for one, and, uh, and two, just the uh, intrinsic value of property and also uh, its ability to do those things that we talked about earlier. Uh, a lot of investors are gonna see a lot of potential in this uh, coin. Yeah, keep in mind that the real estate market is one of the most inefficient markets. You think about getting a title search done. You're trying to do your closing documents. Um, you look at how much we're paying real estate agents just to represent a home buyer. So once property grows and grows and grows, and you have millions and millions of homes on the blockchain, and you're making these sales on chain, the efficiencies are just greatly improved. And then that means lower costs for the sellers and buyers, which is going to make everything so much better. And that's why we love property. That's just one part of it moving forward. So our next question is, Austin asked, I haven't heard you touch on Cardano in a while. What are your thoughts on ADA? And do you think it's a dead coin? Um, I don't think it's a dead coin. I just feel that they're living off of past technology and things move really quickly now, especially in cryptocurrency. And so I just think that they're trying to live off the past and they're not keeping up. I think that they have a technology crisis right now, so I don't see uh, Cardano moving a lot and doing too much in this bull run. I still have a bag, I'll be honest there. I just haven't added any more to the position because I think there are far better projects to invest in. And I just want to touch on something, uh, and I agree with you a lot on what you said about Cardano, but we have to stop using this dead coin. Yeah. You know, is that things have ups and downs and some things do better than others. I mean, uh, NVIDIA went up 10 times last year, right? But there was other stocks that went up 30 times, 40 times, 50 times. Do we consider NVIDIA a dead stock? No, mm -hmm. because a lot of people made a lot of money. Uh, so it just, we don't always have to look for the best possible coin. And if it's not doing 10 times, it's a dead coin. No, it's it's all, every coin has its own rate of appreciation, its own rate of technology innovation, and its own rate of moving forward. We can't always... Uh, compare with, with Dogecoin, so it's a dead coin. It, it, it's not like that. Uh, and any anytime you make a profit, 
uh, on anything. It's always a positive thing. Yeah, it's so crazy because you and I are both old enough to when everything revolved around the rule of 72 and how quickly your money should double. And now people look at returns when it's 300%, 400% as normal, and they don't realize that we were happy back in the day if our money doubled every six or seven years. And now people just expect these doubles to happen in months rather than years, and it's just so crazy. And, and that's where it gets tricky of everyone just understanding what's real and not gambling on all of the high-risk coins and projects and having a base in some of those tried-and-true coins that we talk about. I want to add one more thing before we go into this question from Gina. Over the last three or four years, I want you to think about all the meme coin investors that you know. Are they rich? Nope. Because mm-hmm. they're chasing after meme coins, losing here, losing there. They're constantly looking for that next big thing. So Gina had a question on Solana. Uh, the last couple of weeks or so, there's been technical issues with the Solana network. Do you think these will be resolved? Now, uh, as an investor, I actually see that as an opportunity because the average person uh, tends not to be able to see things fourth dimensionally. And what I mean by that is that they're only know, able to see what's happening right now. The fourth dimension is time. So they can't. a lot of people can't see what's coming next or it's down the future. So whatever's happening today, is that's the permanent state of things. So they panic and sell. Uh, but you have to be willing to, you have to be able to see what's coming next. Now, look at Solana. It's billions of dollars involved in Solana. Meme coins, it's investors, all this stuff. Uh, the, the development team, which is you know probably some of the best developers in the world. Uh, so the, the blockchain doesn't work. It's a new technology. That's not a surprise. Uh, so with all of the money and participants that are involved in this project, there's a huge incentive to fix those issues. Yep. Whenever there's a huge incentive to fix issues, they always get fixed in technolo- technology projects. If we think back in the pandemic, one of my biggest option trades in 2020 was when, uh, when Zoom, uh, Zoom during the pandemic, there was some uh, technical issues with Zoom where people were able to hack into Zoom and take over presentations. Zoom dropped like 15, 20 percent the next day because everybody saw it as a permanent state of things. And I told everybody, I said, they're going to fix this. Zoom is too big of a company. It's too much at stake. They will fix it and they will go forward. I bought some option calls, some call options. A week later, they fixed the problem and Zoom went on to all time highs. And that's what happens in crypto is that when these projects have short term problems, they're going to be solved. Technology right. always gets solved. Let's say we looked at computers or cell phones back in the 70s. Cell phones couldn't even keep a signal down the road. What if we looked at it as a permanent state of things and just gave up on cell phones completely? Or the Internet when it was, it was hard to use and you only show text. Technology tends to improve over time, even more so when there's large amounts of money at stake. So I think it's going to be resolved and I think Solana is going to move forward positively. Yeah, that's why so many people make four, five, or six percent in their portfolios a year, and we make double digits because we understand where technology is going, and we're not fearful of having some of these ups and downs to be able to get those higher gains. So, Mister New York asked, "What do you think of Bitcoin miners, uh, Clean Spark, Riot, and Mara? Will they still do good after the having?" So, great question. Uh, you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Clean Spark. Uh, Armando loves Riot Mara as well. So do I. Um, do I think they'll still do well? Yes, I do. Um, because they're going to, you know, the tide, what is, what is the saying? You know, high tides <coughs> rise all boats. <laughs> Because high tides rise all boats. And so I think they'll continue to do well. Clean Spark was one of my biggest call outs in 2023. I still like it and I still think everyone should take a look at it and own it. So on to the next thing. We are ready to announce our winner of the $100 of Proppy that we promised one lucky commenter would get. And the winner of our first ever raffle is Romar Stanford. So congratulations, Romar. To claim your $100 in Proppy, either comment on the next episode of The Best Way to Contact You or DM Armando or myself on Instagram. You still have until the next episode, which drops next Wednesday. And if we haven't heard from you, we will run it again. So congratulations. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening and following along. You can find us on Instagram at Crypto Trends Podcast and on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. We are so excited for the bull run of 2024 and beyond and sharing all of our crypto insights with all of you. If you love the podcast, please share it with a friend, give it a five-star review, and really help us grow and continue to provide you the best information we can each and every week.